Okay, now we're gonna basically look in technical apparatus that help us to amplify the light that we gain either into our eyes or on the photographic plate or in the scientific instrument. Because you have seen if we split up light in its wavelengths, either we get the plug spectrum, so black body, or we, we uh, get, how to say, the, the, the line spectra. So loads of information. That is, of course, interesting. What is going on there when we are just looking into space? Okay. And here we have to be thankful to people in the Netherlands. It's hard for a German football supporter to say to be thankful to people in the Netherlands because there's an old rivalry, but one has to give credit to people that they did something good. Okay, so let me share screen. Because they were basically the first to develop, at least in the Western Hemisphere, probably in China, they had to have done this beforehand, to develop uh, lenses. Glasses <laughs> and wisdom telescopes. If we look at the telescope, so it's always uh, credited often to Galileo Galilei. Well, he built his own one, but with the ideas he got from the Netherlands. Why was it interesting for the Netherlands? Because they were just about to become a sea power. If you can see a bit further, that gives you an advantage. Okay, nowadays, well, if you go shop, sorry for having choose this particular one, uh, don't want to make advertisement for this company anyway, as a German, I should be doing it for Carl Zeiss. But, well, okay, and why do we use it? Well, What's happening here? We have light that is coming along from object or from a given area in sky, and we put the ending of our telescope towards. This passes through a lens, and now a lens works a bit. It's again air, glass, air, like in the prism. We bend the light rays. We bend the light rays and let it go along. And at a certain point, we put in another lens in a way that the picture from here is now in the same area, the same width as the diameter of our iris. And then the second lens to make the parallel again. Of course, the light coming in, same again. Here. What we would see now is here, uh, basically, everything is turned around by 180 degrees. Yet, our brain is unbelievable, even if you get glasses that do so. It takes you maybe two or three hours and then you can do everything as beforehand, the brain adapts so quickly. At least for some people, for me, probably that's hopeless. Okay, but now we see that basically the ratio of the area covered by this lens compared to the area covered by this lens, light that would previously pass by our eye is now collected into our eye. And the amount of light that we now gain additionally directly scales with this ratio of the, uh, of the lenses the size of the lenses. What means we can now see objects. Let's say if this ratio is 10 to 1, that we get collect 10 times more light. We get objects that are 10 times fainter. Doesn't mean they are 10 times uh, further away, because here we have the intensity. 
I guess just one over ask, man. So again, there comes this factor in. So even 10 times more light means usually just a uh, square root 10 is three point something, so three times further away that we can see. It's not, it's at least a game. Or something that would have been previously just under the, the threshold for us to recognize, we can now see. Uh, massive, massive, massive uh, progress. Of course, if your name was Galileo Galilei, and I've seen suddenly rings around Saturn, I've seen moons around Jupiter. Uh oh. <laughs> And then you published, oh, yo, 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 it is so. Very likely you got that very close to have very hot feet. I think Galileo was then also with the Holy Inquisition and he had to renounce. But parallel, he wrote a book that basically won. So I uh, use the scientific arguments based on his argumentation, uh, on his observations. And the other one used theological arguments back then. And the, the second one was in a big portrait as a bit of a donkey. So, of course, he couldn't publish this book. So he got it smuggled to the Netherlands which were at this time already Protestant. And these heretics, anyway, they, for them it didn't matter. So he got his book published, he got this out. Oh, in the end, uh, we have to be almost thankful for Martin Luther to, to have this uh, wave of reformation going through Europe, which was, of course, there were also Calvin or here, Knox, Yet, it probably at this time it was necessary because the Catholic Church back then was so corrupt. Yet, later on in this course, you're going to see uh, what that the Catholic Church is able to learn. It's, it's nice, of course, as intellectuals to do a bit of Catholic Church bashing, but on the other hand, would has also to be fair. Of course, no, but now we have seen basically this ratio makes our lentils better. We could now say, why don't we just build bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger lentils? Well, there's technical problems. Glass is, is, is not really a solid, it's rather a very, very viscous uh, liquid. So it flows with time, it's hard to pro process, and you might get inside already this like density variation, what means so, uh, the, the, the diffraction of the light is not so uniform. Then we have seen with the prism something very important. This diffraction here is wavelex dependent. Uh oh, what means here you might get <laughs> something that looks already like a rainbow. The red parts and the blue parts are different, scattered. You see basically two different objects. This is called chromatic aberration or lentils are that, oh, lenses, sorry. I was in Germany, it's the same word, lens or lentil. But lenses are hard to fabric, at least on a larger scale than at some point. But people want to have all more bigger and bigger, bigger areas covered to get from the same objects, it's just more photons, more light particles in a given exposure time that you give to make your picture. The next thing was then, oh, why don't we use simply some mirror first? So we increase the initial area much, much wider. If you think this was a radio telescope, <laughs> these are the big, these big bolts like uh, James Bond likes to, to have the final fights. 
in them. I think it was Goldeneye where they find in the one in Puerto Rico, which is a couple of hundred meters in diameter. So they can build it very big. So big mirrors. And mirrors, well, if we do it the parabolic. So we have the light coming in, and if the object is far away, even if the, the, the rays would go out, there's a bit of an angle. If this is far away, the angle is negligible. But we have basically this parallel light coming in, and then reflect it. And if we build the mirror accordingly, we get a focal point. If we take the pictures bef just before the focal point or just behind the focal point, then we get it again. Hopefully, a uh, nice one to one. And we scale down from this big area to a smaller area that would correspond to our eye or to our photographic plate. And we can make these mirrors up to about 10 meters. They were very well to be made. In fact, if you look at these 10 meters mirrors, this is unbelievable. I think it's the mirrors and one of the, the uh, observatories in Las Palmas, where at the moment the volcano is erupting, there's almost 10 meters. And it's polished to such a perfection that if the highest uh, bump on them would be taken out, you would have on the Atlantic Ocean a wave of 30 centimeters height. Oh, oh, just this technology is, is immense. But you see now you can collect the light that is incident on 10 meters instead of your maybe one centimeter, uh, one you know, square centimeter iris. And one square centimeter, they probably need already some substances that usually are illegal to have the iris that wide. Okay, so, well, <clears throat> and with this mirror, obviously we have the light ray falling in, it's reflected. We need somewhere a secondary mirror. We could put in here our scientific instruments, but the scientific instruments are usually big and we want to have multiple of them. We won't want to make photos, we won't want to split up the light, we want, may want one just to uh, measure very precisely how much light in total there was. Oh, different scientific instruments for different purposes. Photometry, when we just make a photograph, spectrometry or bolometry for, for the total energy, light energy that is going. Okay, then we need to reflect this again and have, of course, the middle section. It's anyway pointless to have there the part of the mirror. So we'll have their hole. Now we need to form, of course, the mirrors, mirror accordingly that this middle piece, missing middle piece, is not mattering too much. And of course, we get another source of uncertainty. Every mirror can have a mistake or a, a, a fault, but then, oh. so and then this light that goes in through here, or looks here, this, if they have another mirror to another, but this Naismith focus has then another purpose. So this is a semi-permeable uh, mirror, where light partially goes through and partially is reflected. And now what they do nowadays, because it's much easier, we segment the mirror. We don't build one of these big ones, we made loads of little segments. Easier to make, far easier, far cheaper. Just the cost to make this massive mirrors poor. Okay, so far cheaper and we can basically twist it. 
So what, by the way, what you see here is the CAC, one of the CAC telescopes in Mount Kia, Hawaii. Maybe one should become an uh, 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 astronomer. I always have just to go to places like uh, CERN, which is terrible. Nice around it, nice around it. But Geneva is a super expensive. <laughs> Pine. Oh, six pounds, seven pounds. And I haven't been after the pandemic, so I don't want to know how much it is now. So, <laughs> Grenoble and all these kind of places, but Hawaii sounds nice. But you are 4,000 meters high. You don't have beach holidays. And 4,000 meters high, this is already death zone. You go 4,000 meters, you might, if in the moment you feel headache, immediately go down. You have the height sickness, which is usually deadly. Oh, go down. Oh, some people can stand it, some people can't. Obviously, if you grow up in Nepal, you, you must have, uh, be able to stand this. Okay, okay so. We have now here another thing we can play around maybe. That we can twist this mirror slightly in order to compensate for disturbances in the atmosphere. The same is here true. This mirror might be adjustable. And the rest is very sophisticated techniques. On the other hand, we need to know that there is something going wrong. And what they do is called adaptive optics. It's nowadays standard in the more advanced uh, observatories. So these guys here are not doing playing some Star Wars against the guys from Andromeda who come to steal the astronomer's job. What they are doing is with these laser beams, they make a fake star 50, 60, 70 kilometers above the Earth's surface. They make fake stars, <laughs> which are very broad. And then you look, how good is your picture? You do this, basically with having here, this uh, wavefront, right? And how good is this? Now this disturbance in atmosphere might slightly change. And now you have sophisticated experience and a good computer program to correct automatically these mirrors, to adjust them as well as this mirror to compensate for these atmospheric disturbances so that the picture of your, your facts now becomes optimal. And you can compensate for these atmospheric disturbances to a very, very good degree. In fact, A very large telescope in the Atacama Desert, so operated by us Europeans, European South Observatory. They are better than Hubble. Why? The mirror is much, much larger. And with this adaptive optics, they are so good, they can compensate very well for the atmospheric disturbances. Yo. So playing a bit of uh, Star Wars. But the lasers create this faint star in the upper layers of the atmosphere. And the picture say, serves as test for disturbances. So at the atmosphere, wind, pressure changes, etc. Or you, you adjust these individual mirrors and the, the reflective mirror, and you do this 100 times a minute, and your the, the picture is better than Hubble. I need late, or oh, I should for next year at latest to look up. If you want, you can do this just a comparison Hubble VLT. If you Google this, you should get nice picture. Hopefully, you see VLT is better. 
so very large telescope. The same is very true for the Keck telescopes. So oh, then, of course, this is adaptive optics. We're getting much better pictures. And well, we have seen that the mirror size is better. That basically, it comes now down how much can we make in the mirror. That is now here nicely compared for the different uh, for different observatories like the Paloma in California. 1917, this is very important because Edwin Hubble did their loads of observation and we're going to talk later about his observations. Just the increase. So obviously here they have also changed the principle. Oh, and we see how basically the mirror increases. This has something to do with technology. Then comes, well, here's now the new James Webb Space Telescope, Hubble, so basically almost nothing. Kepler satellite again, very small. And now we go to the modern ones of Spain, Las Palmas. So oh, the Southern African Large Telescope, sold large binocular telescope, whatever. And here's the very large telescope. But now you also see what is the effect. Here we have two arrows, here we have four. It means we double again the capabilities to collect photons. Oh. And then the CAC telescopes is the adaptive optics. Here they have now the adaptive optics, not in the big mirrors, but in the small mirror, in the reflective, in the secondary mirror. And then you see the plans, by the way, here for comparison, a tennis court, and here for comparison, the basketball court. And then you see the plans for the future, giant Magellan telescope in Chile again, there are Rubik telescope, but this has different uh, application. It wants to see as much as possible at one time. Oh, the Subaru, Mount Kea. Obviously, it's something Japanese founded, Subaru, that's also always. Or maybe, maybe, who knows what the Japanese plan in Hawaii. Okay, then. The 30 meter telescope, this is obviously planned for 2027, so 2030 might be operational. The same is true here for the extreme large telescope. The next generation of telescopes. But, so you see now how bigger and bigger and bigger for smaller, fainter and fainter objects. That's its faintness and distance, got something to do also for more and more distant objects, except at some point we're going to see there is a physical limit what you can observe in the, in the visible range with the distance. For this is a James Webb Space Telescope that is infrared. This is beyond the Earth's atmosphere again, a satellite. In fact, quite away from the Earth because it wants to measure infrared. And we're going to learn because of this Doppler red, or because of the redshift. It's not Doppler redshift, it's some other redshift. All these objects are in the infrared. Okay. Well, for a long time, if you look into all these pictures, beautiful pictures often that in astronomy are around. It's often by the Hubble Space Telescope. Because for a long, long time, it was by far the far superior uh, instrument. And only the last couple of years, it got taken over. It was out there since the beginning of the 90s. And back then, it was already very discussed because it costed a couple of billion dollars. And for science, a couple of billion dollars is massive. 
if the, the, the Air Force has really do fighter planes, okay, how many? 50 billions, 100 billion, so pairs, here, take it. We need to do a plus carrier. Okay, here, who cares? For science, this is immense. There were massive discussions. And at some point, Vera Rubin, you're going to hear more often about her in this course. She stepped up in front of the American Congress and basically said them five billion. This is about four. This is the equivalent for every American one or two cinema tickets. And you will get immense knowledge about space and beautiful picture. You can make movies out for the next. A lifetime wouldn't be enough to see them. Unfortunately, she got basically lobbied, she lobbied up it through. And then, well, satellite technology and so on, Yanks. Optics is usually the Europeans, they are a bit better. Oh, for our shame, <laughs> the optics was mostly made in Europe. Again, we have light coming in. For primary and secondary mirror, then go to the instruments, what means cameras, if you want to have pictures, or if you want to see what light is there, spectrometer. That means we split it up into light, some better version of this prism. Oh. Now, Hubble was launched. Uh-oh, <laughs> first pictures come down and all they got was this kind of stuff. This is like when I take my glasses, take them down and throw them in the corner, then would drive Ooh, what I shouldn't do. And usually don't do. So, <laughs> and then it turned out the mirror was crap. They tried there, of course, a new uh, technology and it didn't really work out. Then you have to set the light started. What means, fortunately, back then the space shuttle, you could bring up astronauts and take them down again and bring them relatively precisely close to an instrument that is about the size of a school bus. And then you had people with this massive uh, spacesuit gloves trying to do this is a very fine screwdriver. Oh. But it worked out. The, the glasses worked. And then oh, Apple was working to up to the expectations. In fact, Hubble got in a couple of times uh, more missions where it got repairs and there were new scientific instruments at a, a new cameras, etc. So during its lifetime, which is 1993 to now, 30 years, 5 billion divided by 30 years, that's oh, like a B100 million. That's, Still a lot, especially if you calculate inflation in, but for the outcome of knowledge, I would say that's a good investment. So it can go wrong. And obviously, you often you can't test it. Then you have it working and then boom. Oh. And of course, all this technology is expensive. But on the other hand, both this technology are prototype, which means technology has to be developed. We push on technology development. This is for my field as nuclear structure physicist, detector development. It's a massive, massive justification that we continue, that we have this need for always better detectors because if we develop no better detectors, let them be in 10, 15 years in the hospitals. And people get less radiation dose, or less radiation dose is necessary to for cancer screening or for cancer treatment. So technology drive. 
by science, by fundamental science. But now let's go a bit through the electromagnetic spectrum and I give you a few examples of uh, observatories that are at the moment going on. And let's start here with the radio and microwave, so with the long wavelengths, small energy scale. Radio waves, we obviously can do it on the ground. And these are usually these uh, big antennas, these massive arrays of antennas. But here the ALMA, the Atacama, large millimeter, submillimeter array. Again, this is operated by the uh, by European Space Agency, ESO. At this case, European Southern Observatories. 66 antenna in northern Chile on an altitude of 5,000 meters. So, oh, if you feel proud that you climbed up Ben Lomond, well, you have every reason to be proud. It's still compared to, to here, it's you know, a molehill. Okay, again. We want to go to the southern hemisphere because there the night sky is a bit more interesting. It radio waves what means between a millimeter wavelengths and 100 kilometer or even higher. What is built and probably now starting to operate, I should look this up, is the star. So square kilometer array. These are about 1,000 antennas. Previously, they were what, fighting whether it should go to, to South Africa or to Australia, but then a compromise was reached. And half of them are, or part is in South Africa, part is now in Australia. That should now start it. And well, you see the, all these loads of antenna that here for size comparison, there's the, this car standing next to one. Again, but this is no almost mass fabrication of these antennas, but for basic research, quite some investment. Now, of course, if we want to go from microwaves and radio waves, well, alternatively, you have these massive uh, dishes. So, but. There, I'm going to show you later on uh, the one in Tsingtao with 5,000 meters, uh, 500 meters, 600 meters diameter. But now, going to the other wavelengths, microwaves, we see we have here already a problem. They are observed mm -hmm. microwaves make, like to make water spin, rotate water molecules. If you have water vapor in the atmosphere, you will have obviously absorption that the stuff is gone. So you need to go to the sky. You still get enough microwaves on Earth. You're going to see later. Here, typical, ex uh, typical experiments. We would talk here about millimeter to meter, maybe uh, the wavelengths. Nice example is WMAP. But Wilkinson microwave and isotropy probe. What this guy did, we're going to see later. Microwaves. So water molecules that would take. <clears throat> or cosmic microwave background. It had a predecessor called COBE. Cosmic observer background or background explorer or something like this. And then plug. So if it, then three times the investment is made <laughs> for better and better and better satellites, he says it's, it must be something important. If you want to have deep, more and more detailed look, then probably there's already another preparation for the next mission for, the, for this cosmic microwave background. And of course, going to the infrared, you see here, this is the Spitzer Space Telescope. On the one side, there's the shield towards the sun. See the solar cells and so on, but also temperature shield. 
you want to have this operating always at the same temperature. That means you also need to cool it down because most of these temperatures are very low. If you're interested in, if you think back, this is now 750 nanometer to millimeter in wavelengths. In terms of temperatures, this is a few Kelvin up to maybe four, five hundred Kelvin. So a couple of thousand Kelvin even. Infrared, if you think back wavelengths, yeah, this is a couple of, of thousand Kelvin already. So Spitzer Space Telescope, and at the moment or near future, I have to check this really when it whether it's already started or whether the pandemia has uh, delayed it again. It was due for September 2021. The James Webb Space Telescope. Its purpose you're gonna learn when we talk about galaxies and their evolution, because this is going for the first galaxies. That is where the first, the first big stars or where the first galaxies to form stars. Do we need the galaxy to form stars or stars to form galaxies? Usually there wouldn't be a galaxy without stars. So. But this is one of these chicken and egg problems. So, and we need uh, infrared because everything is so red shifted. What was you even what was usually blue is very red shifted. The effect we're going to talk about next week or in two weeks at latest. That's the James Webb. Again, infrared. Optical, well, this is the very large telescope. In the, again, the Atacama Desert in North Chile, 5,000 meters high. You see here basically a mountain, but the top has been cut off. So landscape architecture. And here this four big uh, ones, four big mirrors, what means you get four times the area, you get four times more light. But at some point, uh, the costs outweigh the, the use of, I think, a fifth or sixth or seventh. And of course, uh, every mountain top has a certain amount of space, and that's over. You have not to forget the Keck Observatory, so Mauna Kea, Hawaii, the very high altitude again, 4,200 meters. You see the mountain top flat, bit flat. Oops. Leads us to why do we want to have them on mountain tops? Well, one reason is clear. We have less atmosphere. The atmosphere is less dense. And then, well, if you are hill hiking, sometimes in summer, you get up in the morning and there's fog. It looks gray. Like at the moment, look outside, it's gray. But then you walk up a wood row. At a certain point, you might make it over the clouds. And you have nice sunshine. There are no clouds above you. It looks like you're standing in this ocean of clouds. Oh, so you go high, you're above, but most of the time above the clouds you can observe. It's of course, uh, for the astronomers, it's always a bit gambling. In order to be able to observe what you want, your scientific mission, you need, of course, to apply for beam time. And then there are usually people coming along and request much more beam time that, that there is available. It means there is a committee. You need to write down what do you want to measure, how do you want to measure, how you want to do the analysis, etc. And then there is a committee of other scientists that says whether it's interesting enough, whether it's feasible. And if you pass this, you might get beam time, uh, observation time in this case. For me, it's beam time. And 
It costs, of course, a lot. You have to consider the stuff to build was expensive, that it's in this extreme condition. You have there a couple of hundred me uh, thousand meter high. And in order to build this, you first need to build a road. Then you don't, if you have combustion engine and the air is so thin, you want to have thin air, but if you have a combustion engine, there is no oxygen around. The, the combustion process is not working anymore. You need the special cars where the oxygen is directly injected into the cylinder from an oxygen bottle. <laughs> All this kind of stuff. And not everybody's up there. Then you best when you go there for observation or the, the stuff that works there every day to drive up these uh, 4,000 meters, you live on 2,000 meters, what means 2,000 meter high, and have 10% of, of altitude. You drive this up. That's a lot build. Ooh. It's already a uh, ten percent means twenty kilometer at least load, at least. Oops. So you want to live there for a while. It means you need also leisure facilities. You cannot have people there for months or two months and just working and sleeping. That doesn't work out there. Bro. Well, you probably have already some some mental problems before you even consider start going there. And otherwise, you got them when you come back. So massive technical challenges. Then, uh, not to forget, this is the Atacama Desert. Oh, good Hawaii is nice, but where you are there, this is still some desert life surrounding. Supply stuff. And you have to take everything down. Otherwise, it looks like two months like a waste dump. So it, it piles up these uh, massive logistic problems. But still, obviously, the, 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 the advantages of having no clouds often, having far less atmosphere, the disturbances so outweigh many of these problems, these logistic problems. But of course, then uh, with the clouds, is, you apply for this beam type. And then you go there and then you have five cloudy days, <laughs> five days beam time, five cloudy days. And of course, the next one is then coming for his beam time. There is no chance to, to expand this. Oh. Well, it's similar. I was flying from Kentucky to CERN. And then uh, the software for the accelerator couldn't run because the Windows system it was running on made an automatic update. And the guy who knew how to fix it, he was hiking in the mountains and deliberately didn't have any kind of uh, oh, mobile device with him. Quite understandable. At some point, you need some breaks. Okay, but basically this thing. Then the next thing is, uh, on the mountain top, you usually don't have too many neighbors. A few gods that run around, but they don't have lights on at night. You don't have stray light. If you want to do in Coates Observatory at uh, Paisley, you have a massive problems because Glasgow Airport has all night long lights on. Street lamps are a massive disaster. Oh. You don't want to have light around. Another advantage. But nowadays, the problem is you get this beam time at latest, uh, just after dawn or before dusk. Dusk, and before dawn, sorry, from dusk till dawn. Yeah. Okay, so just after dusk, before dawn, you have basically the earth, you are in the shadow, but the sun's light might be scattered and go into the night sky still, while you already start trying to observe something. And now this light might illuminate satellites that whirl over you. And this becomes more and more and more of a problem. Especially now with Elon Musk's uh, plans for the space link satellites. In low orbits, Low orbits means there you get the problem massively. 
because they are uh, even the faintest uh, satellite is still much, much, much more bright than faint objects that you want to observe. Oh, and they are so they will become so frequent that there's no no point in saying we don't take the data recorded while they were flying over. And then that's what they do to your picture. Oh. Between technology and technology, you have some fights. So, well, so basically, we were now at the visible. We have seen this Hubble Space Telescope nicely into sky, which doesn't have these problems. But now, UV, again, we need to go into sky. Again, very expensive. We have this galaxy, Galaxy Evolution Explorer. This is no oval. <clears throat> this again, uh, you look at different galaxies in order to learn about the old one. There's the Andromeda. It's nearby. You get the most details. Of it. And you want to see more violent processes where harder radiation is produced. Or what you got to learn is uh, young stars. That is, the atmosphere of the star hasn't settled yet. It means that the UV that is coming from inner shafts, in the, the more inner you go, the hotter the star will become. So the very center where you have millions of degrees, occasionally even coming close to billions of degrees Celsius. The other of the talk there about Celsius or Kelvin doesn't matter anymore. If you have a million or a million and 200, that's the difference. Of course, if you have zero or 200, that's a massive difference. So <clears throat> what one often gets if a young stars, very young stars, that just started to burn before the atmosphere settled down, we see a lot of UV light coming out. Or if we have a star where the UV power is too high compared to the overall energy output, Drug spectrum is basically a bit shifted. We can say this must be a young star. So we can then also in galaxies look where are the young stars? Where do they form? Oh, then if you want to go to more violent stuff, if you want to look really into something without uh, having absorption effects by gas or whatever that you might have in the uh, optical and and infrared, even UV. You look, you take the X-ray picture. <laughs> but this is done by, for example, Chandra Space Telescope or Newton X and M. Newton is something European, I think Chandra was from the NASA, from the Americans. Oh, oh, shorter and shorter wavelengths, so 10 millimeters down to one hundredth of a millimeter, but nanometer, but this border to the next one, gamma rays, the real hard stuff is no floating. The real hard stuff, gamma rays, this happens when uh, you have nuclear process. So this little charged object in the center of an atom, we can also excite consisting of protons and neutrons and can excite them. And when they jump back to the ground state configuration, they again emit radiation. And this is usually the called gamma radiation, which is very energetic, even more energetic than X-ray. Oh, then you can again, if you have a satellite, and optics is a bit hard, what you can do is let, you make a lead mask in front. And uh, if you form this nicely, then you get some directional dependency. But otherwise, there's no chance. But that has, of course, the problem. It's very heavy to transport it into space, what you must, otherwise, the stuff is absorbed. It's expensive. So, integral satellite would then look into its very extreme hard uh, X rays. Or well, nowadays, what is also the Fermi. I think Fermi is between X-rays and gamma rays. 
So we set the light, which you're gonna hear also soon about, which looks for X and gamma ray bursts, so-called kilonovas. Okay, then well, so we are basically through the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, to come to a conclusion, well, if we look at the same object, which is here, the Crab Nebula, and look into different, uh, uh, how to say, different uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, we might learn about the object. First of all, if you look, of course, classically, this would be visible light. This Hubble, we see this nice structure. It look, looks like a filament, like in the Hollywood movie, when you had an explosion, and then you make a, a, a stop, you make a pause. It's basically an expanding gas cloud. Expansion, you can nicely see, if you look at it, the spectral lines, and then you might have a gas coming towards us, so we get gas that is coming towards us, is blue shifted, and then gas that is going away is red shifted. It means for this nice fine line becomes no what we call Doppler widened. For me, as I said, this guy who earns his money with doing such spectros could be a nightmare, but occasionally an ounce effect. So we learn about also, what is in there, we see a lot of uh, heavier elements like sodium uh, up to iron nickel being formed and even a bit beyond. These are the different colors. Occasionally, elements again, sodium would nicely have uh, transitions which are in the bright yellow. So, sodium always appears to be yellowish. Nitrogen. Uh, uh, hoax nitrogen is a bit bluish, but so we can associate different colors also with what could be there. So optic, then we look this infrared. What do we see in infrared? Oops, here is a bit of a brighter spot, this white, and then we see again these filaments that look a bit like an ex expanding uh, gas cloud. Radio wave. No, oh, there's not much more information, at, at least, that, but there is something in the center here that uh, oh, it's a bit hot. UV, well, at least the stuff that comes out, uh, we see, of course, there's some core, which is at least denser and, and obviously a bit hotter than the rest. X-rays, low energy X-rays, we see some disk-like structure. That stuff is coming out perpendicular to the disk. Disk with some kind of jets. Ooh. Oh, well, with X rays, we see the pixelation is not that fine, it's not so. We see there is something, and it would be now interesting to look in the spectrum which nuclei are there. What do we get? So obviously we see all the time something different. By the way, what you see here in the very center of this accretion disk is the neutron star, the dead corpse of a star that exploded about a thousand years ago. And since this one thousand years ago, the, the, the gas cloud is corresponding to the material that was previously bound in this star is expanding. In fact, after a thousand years, these are now three of a couple of light years. I don't know the exact number. This is again one of these numbers. It, it just uh, ran your, your, your brain with without having any use, uh, use or output of it. A couple of light years that should do it. So already quite, quite expanded. And you see the different insights that we get different points of views and you're going to see this later more and more even though with Spitzer Space Telescope if we have gas clouds and also dense that they appear just black in the night sky because you have everywhere stars behind and then suddenly there's a black part 
it has to be a very dense gas cloud. But if you take a, a infrared, you, you can see into what's going on in there. So this year is quite interesting. This was this what I told you, 2054. The Chinese have nicely reported there was a new star in the sky that you could observe during brightest daylight. Well, this year is not true. There is this one monk from Flanders, but obviously nobody took a monk from Flanders serious because we know how. how how much the monks like to consume beer, and we know how strong the Belgian uh, Trappist beer is. So, okay. So now to come to an end, I was mentioning this extreme large telescope, and there is on YouTube a nice video how it's built. So please, please, please. Have a look at this. Oh, not please, please. If you are interested in take at some point, you think it's 10, 15 minutes, have a look on it. And, oh, it's about building this extreme large telescope. It's larger than the Colosseum in Rome. So on a mountain top that had been flattened in an earthquake area. In the desert somewhere in, in Chile, in the Andes in Chile, Ooh. oh, it's quite impressive. It's 6,000 tons, I think, structure that is then a uh, uh, damped, rota possible to rotate. And you have seen the stones, the stones are protected, the mirror and stuff from dust. No. <laughs> okay. So I hope you enjoy this. You also will learn a bit more about this mirror, how they're deformable, these secondary mirrors, and about physics names. Search for exoplanets that always sounds nice. Planets around other stars and their properties that always sounds nice. Good yourself. So, okay. Then see you in the question answer session, hopefully with some questions. Eventually I can provide some answers, eventually not, because I'm just a physicist, not, not a superhero. Okay, and hopefully see you next week again. Oh. <laughs>